the there we go. Okay. Where I'd signed off, we talked about models that purport to explain how it is that altruistic behavior can be favored by selection. Uh, there are times in which altruism is favored because it's the only uh, working strategy. Uh, I introduced you to the concept of the green beard gene, uh, where if you have a gene that creates a phenotype and causes altruistic behavior towards other individuals in the with the same phenotype, uh, under some circumstances that can be favored by selection. And I was finishing up talking about the concept of inclusive fitness, where you have to calculate the fitness of an allele not solely on the basis of its effect on the phenotype of individuals that have it, but its effect on the phenotype of relatives of the individuals that have it. And so if we have a gene that causes or influences individuals that have it to give up a benefit for the sake of their relatives, their relatives are probably carrying the same gene for the simple reason that they are relatives, because relatives by definition uh, carry the same, many of the same genes as you do. So even if the altruist gives up the chances of reproducing, if its kin reproduce enough, the altruism gene can increase in frequency in the population. So Hamilton's rule states that altruism will be favored if the benefit to the recipient of the altruism multiplied by the coefficient of relatedness uh, equals the cost to the, or is greater than the cost to the donor, which is the basis for Haldane Dane's quip uh, that he would not give up his life for his brother, but he would if it was two brothers or eight cousins. And we talked about how you calculate that coefficient of relatedness and I gave you the case study of Belding's ground squirrels. Um, here's the second one. This is the white-fronted bee eater, a native to the East African savannas. Uh, it's been studied since the late 1980s by a gent named J.T. Emlin. Here's some bee eaters with their home in the background. Uh, they nest in holes in muddy riverbanks. And these tend to be fairly densely packed. Uh, bee eaters are living in the student housing of the ornithological world. Uh, there's not infinite amounts of real estate here. You know, a muddy riverbank, um, you know, is a fairly limited environment and it doesn't stretch indefinitely long. Uh, colonies average 200 individuals and breeding pairs have to find a hole to raise their young in and parents spend a great deal of energy feeding their hatchlings and because competition for holes is, is be, come on Wagoner because space is limited there's a great deal of competition for holes uh, not every bee eater can excavate a hole in the mud bank and find a mate and start raising babies uh, what's more is that on average, almost half of the hatchlings die before they mature, uh, frequently from starvation. Uh, so kind of rough being a bee eater. What young bee eaters will often do is stay at their parents' nests and help to feed both their mothers and their younger siblings. You know, you know how it is, you know, you're 18, you want to go off and move to another city and, you know, get a job, uh, but mom insists that you stay at home and, you know, pay some rent and do chores and contribute to the household. Um, bee eaters do this. Parents have been known to harass their older offspring until they give up trying to mate. <sighs> Sorry, momentary flashback to high school. Um, right. And the reason why this is favored is that having a helper at the nest doubles the chances of hatchling survival. Um, 
hatchlings are twice as likely to survive if they're raised by parents and an older sibling as they are uh, by having parent, parents raising them alone. Uh, the more helpers are there, the greater the odds that hatchlings will survive. And so helper birds can gain indirect fitness because they are raising their siblings or sometimes their half siblings, but the gains to fitness are slightly greater than if they had attempted to breed themselves. A bee eater that leaves the nest as soon as it can and tries to reproduce will have, will leave fewer copies of its alleles in the next generation compared to a bee eater that sticks around the nest and helps raise its siblings, not permanently, but at least for one season before going off on its own. Uh, the helper bee eaters do eventually get to pair up and raise their own offspring, but bee eaters that spend a year helping raise their siblings leave more copies of their alleles in the population than bee eaters that don't. So in this case, this is a very nice example of uh, kin selection. A third really cool study that brings it, I think makes it even more clear is a look at parasitic wasps. When I was a lad, my mom had a big backyard garden and there's nothing she likes more than freshly picked tomatoes you know, picking a tomato right out of the garden with the summer warmth still on it, and then taking it inside and putting it, slicing it up and putting it between two slices of Wonder Bread slathered in blue plate mayonnaise is just heaven. So we used to have a lot of tomato plants and every so often I'd see tomato hornworm caterpillars, which are exactly the same color as the tomato leaves and not that easy to see. And they will just strip a tomato plant to sticks if you let them. Fortunately, there are parasitic wasps that will lay their eggs inside tomato hornworm eggs or larvae. And I saw this a couple of times, you'd see tomato hornworms slowly staggering around on a tomato plant and they were covered in what looked like little q-tip tips sticking out of the body. Those q-tip tips were the cocoons of a parasitic wasp. Uh, mommy wasp had laid its eggs in the tomato hornworm egg or young caterpillar and the eggs had hatched into larvae that had crawled through the hornworm and eaten it from the inside out, starting with the less vital organs and saving the vital organs for last. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this, but it's something I saw as a kid. And there's a ridiculously large number of species of wasp, mostly in a family called the Braconidae, that do this. They will lay eggs inside the eggs or larvae of other insects. And this is one, Copidosoma floridanum, laying an egg inside an embryo of a moth that feeds on cabbage, if memory serves, uh, called Trichoplusia ni, which was evidently named by Monty Python in honor of the knights who say ni. Anyway, um, if you talk with Dr. Desord, uh, sometimes uh, Trichoplusia ni uh, has this feeding behavior that involves cutting latex vessels uh, in the leaves that they're about to eat. And anyway, he's quite knowledgeable about Trichoplusia me. One of their parasitoids is Copidosoma floridanum, and one egg can produce over 3,000 larvae. Uh, the egg just divides into multiple cells that separate, and each one gives rise to a new larva uh, it's the equivalent of, you know, identical twins, except in this case, it's identical 3,000 tuplets. That's not particularly weird. It's called polyembryony. Uh, anybody that, uh, you know, some of you might know that armadillos do this. Every fertilized egg gives rise to uh, quadruplets in armadillos. That's not the weird part. The weird part is that each egg produces two types of larvae. 
Uh, down there at the bottom, that's a reproductive larva, and that will eventually develop into an adult. So some of the larvae from one egg develop into reproductive larvae. Others develop into precocious larvae, uh, which are shown at the top. Those never develop into adults. Uh, they will die in the uh, they will die in the Trichoplusia caterpillar that they were born in. What they do is they've got humongous jaws and they'll hunt down and kill parasitoid larvae from other wasps. Uh, so if two copidosoma or if two copidosoma wasps lay an egg in the same Trichoplusia caterpillar, both of those eggs will hatch and the precocious larvae of each one will try to kill reproductive and precocious larvae from the other one. So yeah, these, these larvae basically develop into hunter-killer larvae uh, that will kill off any other larvae that they're not related to. Um, in fact, uh, there you've got one where uh, some reproductive larvae have been fluorescently stained uh, so these three blobs kind of in the middle are reproductive larvae. And on the right, um, that's a precocious larva uh, that's attacking them because that precocious larva comes from a different mother. Um, and you can see its gut is uh, lit up uh, because it's just eaten um, a lot of tissue uh, from the stained reproductive larvae from a different mother. The reason this works is that all the larvae from one egg are clones, which means that the coefficient of relatedness is one. They're all genetically identical, which by the way means that this is a really cool case of phenotypic plasticity. Uh, if some of those larvae develop into reproductives and other develop into precocious despite being genetic clones of each other. That means there's some great phenotypic plasticity going on. Um, and it works in this case because since all of the larvae are clones, their coefficient of relatedness is one. The precocious larvae might seem like they're giving up the chance to ever reproduce because they will never mature into a, adults and they will die right there in, you know, in the Trichoplusia caterpillar. But they are passing on just as many genes by enabling one reproductive larva from their brood to survive as they would be by surviving themselves. So if there is a gene, and I assume there is, that causes a larva to sacrifice its, lar its life as a precocious larva, that gene is also passed on in all of the reproductive larvae from the same brood. So if one precocious larva can save the lives of at least two of its reproductive clone mates, then the gene that makes it do it is going to be passed on you know, twice as frequently as it would if the precocious larva didn't become precocious but had babies on its own. I'm not explaining this very well. I think it's my usual sleep deprivation, but hopefully you get the, uh, you get the picture there. Uh, in this case, it's not more strange that, excuse me, hey, sweetie, I've got to mute for a second. Okay, sorry about that. We had a cat that was about to commit property damage. Because why not? He's a cat. Okay. One of the coolest examples of altruism is eusociality. 
eusocial organisms live in colonies where there's only one female that is reproductive. Uh, she's usually called the queen. Other members of the colony serve the colony and they serve the queen, uh, but they do not reproduce themselves. And very often you've got separate castes of individuals. Um, you see this taken to its extreme in uh, some uh, species of termite uh, where you have worker termites and soldier termites with enormous jaws. Uh, I think there's an African species where you have soldiers with jaws and also soldiers that squirt acid. Uh, there's at least one Asian species where you have worker termites and soldiers that fight with huge jaws and a different type of soldier um, that uh, tear themselves open to release poisonous goo onto enemies. Uh, you can have several different types of soldier. The best known examples of this are insects in the class Hymenoptera, which is the ants, bees, and the wasps. Uh, honeybees are the one I'm going to be talking about the most because that's the one I know best. Uh, but there are ants that do the same thing. Uh, and then termites are famous for this, uh, where you have a single reproductive queen who cranks out eggs all of her life, and she's taken care of by the worker termites, and sometimes the colony is defended by soldiers as well. Uh, there's actually a couple of examples of eusocial mammals, uh, two species of mole rat, uh, which means that you know, Kim Possible's pet naked mole rat probably was not very happy because eusocial individuals often do not do very well outside of their colonies. Uh, so here you've got you some honeybees. Um, up on the right, that's a worker bee, and she is female, uh, although she does not have ovaries that ever fully develop. Uh, so she can't reproduce, and um, she's diploid. Uh, she is the product of an egg from the queen and a sperm uh, from a drone. And she will survive about three weeks, and she will start by taking care of the babies. Uh, she will graduate to a career flying out to gather nectar and pollen uh, when she's not good for anything else. Uh, she can always just stand at the entrance to the hive and fan her wings uh, to keep the hive cool on warm days. She may end up her life dying from exhaustion as a living air conditioner, and then her body gets thrown out of the colony. Um, yeah, that's the way it goes. On the left, the thing with the enormous eyes, that's a drone. Uh, that's a male, and he's haploid. He was produced from an unfertilized egg. He will do exactly one thing. In the spring, he will take to the skies and fly up to these areas that may be as much as 100 feet off the ground. And we're not really sure how bees know where these places are, but they're called DCAs, drone congregation areas. And he and his buddies will fly around up there. And then queens from the colonies, new queens, queens that have not mated yet, will fly up to these drone congregation areas. And every drone at the DCAs will try to mate with the queens. And the queen will be flying along, tailed by a bunch of drones, forming what beekeepers call a comet. The first drone to reach the queen will seize her, insert his copulatory organ into her, and ejaculate sperm with such force that his copulatory organ is blown off and remains sticking in the queen bee while he himself spirals to earth and crashes like an A60 shot down at the Battle of the Coral Sea. All right, World War II reference there. And then the second drone will catch up with the queen and plunge his copulatory organ into her, and his tallywhacker will promptly explode, and he will die. Um, and this can go on for some time until the queen returns to her hive, 
having mated with a drone from a different colony. Queens don't mate with their own drones because the drones are all developed from the queen's unfertilized eggs. Yeah. So on that one flight, the queen will store all of the sperm that she will need uh, over the next, uh, if things go well, over the next two years. And she will have all the sperm that she needs to start cranking out all of the workers that she needs to build a big thriving colony. The upshot of this is that this is a queen and a lot of beekeepers put spots of paint on the queen in order to be able to find her easily. The queen does not naturally have that pink spot on her thorax, uh, but the queen is surrounded here. You can see there's a bunch of workers that are all facing her in a circle. She is cranking out this sweet smelling stuff called Nasanov pheromone. Uh, and the workers just absolutely love it. They cannot get enough of it. You know, this is what makes them, you know, the entourage of B. Yonsei in the middle right there. Huh, see what I did there? Yeah, she's B. Yonsei. And because of this haplodiploidy, the worker bees are all theoretically full sisters because the workers share more genes with each other than they would with their own offspring. And the reason is, is if the worker bees are all descended from the same father, then every worker bee has half their genes in common because their father was haploid. The father in this case does not put out only half of his genes the way that a diploid father would. Right, your dad gave you one half of his genes, but a male bee, if he reproduces, passes on all of his genes to every one of his offspring. So these worker bees share half their genes in common because they all got the same genes from dad, plus they share a quarter of their genes in common because they got some of their genes from their diploid mom. So the upshot is that these worker bees are more closely related to their sisters than they would be to their own offspring, which is kind of weird. Here's the thing, queens don't last forever and eventually a queen will start failing. Uh, the queen may stop being able to produce all of that sweet, sweet Nazanoff pheromone. And when that happens, the workers will take one of their sisters uh, they'll take a larva, and instead of putting her in one of those hexagon-shaped cells, they'll build a special little wax chamber for her that looks a little bit like a peanut or maybe a chewed piece of gum uh, called a queen cell. In fact, here they've built several uh, queen cells. Those are those kind of lumpy things, uh, more or less in the middle of the picture. There's more room and the worker bees will secrete a hormone-rich substance called royal jelly. And all of them got a little bit of royal jelly when they were larvae, but the potential new queens will bathe in the stuff and that will cause them to fully mature sexually. Uh, that will make their ovaries uh, mature and when they hatch, they will be fully sexually mature queens. So the workers have taken one of their sisters and made her into a queen. And remember that the workers share three quarters of their genes with this new queen. Uh, incidentally, if you're wondering why they made multiple queen cells, uh, the first queen to emerge will go around and promptly sting uh, all of her potential rivals. Uh, you can't have more than one queen in a hive at a time. So yeah, the first queen will promptly execute anybody else that emerges. And so the idea is that worker bees can pass on more copies of their alleles by raising sisters than they could by reproducing on their own. Uh, and that means that genes for eusociality would be favored. 
uh, a worker bee that helps her sisters has a greater chance of passing on her alleles than a worker bee that turns into a queen and tries to reproduce on her own because sisters are more closely related to each other than mothers and daughters are related to each other because of haplodiploidy. Okay, I haven't done it in a while, but I used to keep bees and I've seen some of these things happening myself. That's a beautiful explanation for the origin of eusociality. Unfortunately, it's wrong. Uh, someone once said that every scientific problem has a solution that is beautiful and wrong. And this is, uh, this is a case. Eusociality is being explained here by haplodiploidy, by sex determination by chromosome number. Haploids are male, uh, diploids are female. Uh, but hymenopterans, ants, bees, and wasps, I think all of them, as far as I know, determine sex by haplodiploidy, but they don't, but only a small handful of species are eusocial. Most ants, bees, and wasps are solitary. Or if they live in colonies, you know, they might live in groups, but they don't have that full spectrum of eusociality. Um, and then again, termites are not haplodiploid, and yet they are eusocial. These are some termites where the light-colored ones are workers, and then you can see the soldiers with their uh, much darker brown coloration, and if you look carefully, you can see the black jaws that they've got sticking out of them. Termites are not haplodiploid. Uh, naked mole rats are not haplodiploid. Uh, neither are gall aphids or Australian eucalyptus weevils, or as far as I know, the only marine haplodiploid organisms, uh, snapping shrimp in the genus Synalpheus. So most cases of eusociality don't occur among haplodiploids, and most haplodiploid organisms aren't eusocial. And here's the thing, you might have noticed that when that queen bee is on her, what they call her nuptial flight, she flies through a drone congregation area, a bunch of drones chase after her, and she will actually mate with multiple males. I think the record is something like, like 20. Uh, beekeepers actually call this mating sign because when a, a queen returns to the hive after mating, uh, she will have the broken off copulatory organs of all of the males that she's mated with uh, sticking out of her. And I want to say the record is 20. I, I could be wrong about that, but it is true that a queen can mate and probably usually does mate with multiple males uh, during that nuptial flight she may actually be able to have, since she will store their sperm for up to two years, she may actually have some kind of control over whose sperm she uses. I've heard that suggested. I'm not up on the latest uh, research there. But regardless, if she mates with several males, the story falls apart because those worker bees are not necessarily all full sisters. Uh, if two workers have different fathers, they'll only share one quarter of their genes in common. Um, no different there from half-siblings in, in humans or other diploid species. By the way, that picture there is what happens to the old queen in a hive. Uh, when the hive starts making a new queen, the old queen will take some of the workers and leave the hive and they'll settle in places like this while they're looking for a place to build a permanent colony. Uh, so the queen is at the center of this ball of bees. All of the bees are snuggling up to her because they love that Nazanov pheromone. And around here, this usually happens at about the end of April. So in roughly a month, uh, you might see a, a ball of bees uh, somewhere on trees outside or something like that. Um, 
it's actually the time when the bees are most harmless. They are totally tripping on that pheromone. Uh, they're not especially aggressive and beekeepers can actually knock those balls of bees off into a hive and get them to settle there. Uh, I've actually done that before. So yeah, if you see one of these, don't call the exterminators, call a beekeeper. In fact, it's possible for beekeepers to introduce a completely unrelated queen into a hive. And sometimes they'll do this deliberately. Uh, you can buy queens in little wooden cages. And you can see there's a little white plug at the left end of this. Um, if you put one of, one of these into your hive, the workers at first will try to mob the queen uh, but the wire cage protects her. After a couple of days, they get used to her and they start tripping out on those wonderful pheromones that she's cranking out. And they'll chew through that white plug, which is made of sugar candy, uh, in order to release the queen. And they'll be fine. Uh, so workers can accept a queen that is completely unrelated. And workers are known to stray into colonies where they're not related to any bee. Uh, in fact, if you've got two beehives and one of them doesn't have enough workers to bring you lots of honey, you can actually shake workers out from one hive into the weak hive and the workers will be fine. You know, termites, they'll fight to the death. Um, honeybee colonies, they don't. And in fact, there's a certain amount of drift among colonies where workers will if they get a little bit disoriented, they can end up in a completely different colony and they'll do fine. So you have workers, you know, caring for their sisters that they're not that closely related to, or in some cases that they're not related to at all. So that's why this beautiful, simple explanation for eusociality is very probably wrong. What I've now heard suggested is that whenever you do have eusociality, it tends to develop among organisms with a common lifestyle. They're living in very close quarters. Uh, they've got access to very rich resources. In the case of honeybees, it's all that nectar and pollen. And those have to be actively defended. Uh, I once had one of my hives rob another one of my hives, and it was the damnedest thing. Um, bees from one of my hives got into the top of uh, my other hive and freaking murdered all of the bees that were trying to defend it and absolutely picked that honeycomb clean of, of honey. Uh, it was kind of disheartening and I, you know, I didn't get any honey that year, damn it. Um, under those circumstances, you probably have a lot, you do have kin selection going on in that workers are still related to the queen. Workers are so mutually dependent on each other. All those bees are so dependent on each other that selection in this case may be operating on the level of colonies, not on individuals. Bee colonies do things that no individual bee can. Uh, they found some evidence recently that honeybees, uh, honeybee colonies can actually respond to their environment. Um, it's almost as if they've got moods. Uh, honeybee colonies can store information about their environment in ways that individual honeybees cannot. And it may be analogous to what went on when early eukaryotic cells started glomming together into larger and larger clumps and evolving into the earliest animals. You know, if you think about it, your own cells are just as selfless as worker bees do. Your own cells will do exactly what they're told. They'll give everything they've got for the welfare of your body. They'll die when instructed. And if one of your cells decides, hey, I want to go be an individual and not selflessly serve the body until my death, well, what we call that is cancer. 
So if animals evolved from single cell protists, somewhere there must have been an analogous transition between selection acting on individual cells and individuals acting on whole bodies instead of individual cells. And eusociality may be a kind of halfway house in that process. We can cert, I mean, so we may be, th we may be more accurate to think of selection acting at the level of colony rather than acting on the level of the individual B. The individual B is maybe no more important than the individual intestinal lining cells that uh, sacrifice themselves and die to the tune of something on the order of, I want to say, uh, 50 billion a day. OK, can we apply this to humanity? When you try to use evolutionary reasoning to explain all behavioral sciences, this is usually called sociobiology. And when you apply sociobiology to humans, it's more commonly called evolutionary psychology. This has been a very controversial subject. Um, evolutionary psychology has some very loud fanboys, and it also has some very loud detractors. There are cases where it seems to work. There are also cases where it remains extremely controversial and cases where it's been shown not to work very well. The boat got pushed out by E.O. Wilson, who published a book called Sociobiology, The New Synthesis in 1975. And it touched off such a storm of controversy that when Wilson got up to speak at a conference in 1978, uh, he was protested. And as he was about to speak, a protester rushed the stage, grabbed the pitcher of ice water that was there for the speakers, dumped it on his head, and ran off yelling, you're all wet, Wilson. This is not the kind of thing that normally happens at scientific meetings. Uh, there can certainly be debate and discussion, but you usually don't get protesters rushing the stage, or I've never seen it happen. The reason this was such a big deal was that the reason the protesters were mad was that they felt that Wilson was guilty of something called biological determinism. That is the idea that humans inevitably act and behave in certain ways not because of their choice, not because of the culture they were raised in, not because of the ethical and moral codes that they may have developed, but because of their biological nature. The idea that genes exert control over what humans do, that humans are not free to choose behaviors. You can see how that bothers some people, and I'll show you why. The prevailing opinion at the time was that humans are born as essentially blank slates, um, that all of the complicated things that humans learn to do, good and bad, everything from speaking the language that you grew up speaking uh, to worshiping the God that you were taught to worship as a child, if any, uh, to hating the ethnic groups that you were taught to hate, Hopefully none of you were, but all too many people have been. That all of that is ultimately not entirely learned. A lot of it may still be learned, but ultimately there is a biological component to it that some of the things that we do, we do because our genes influence us to do them. And the reason for that is those genes were adaptive, maybe not now, but at some point in our past history, uh, maybe 300,000 years ago when our most distant Homo sapiens ancestors were all running around on the African savanna, bonking each other in the head with big rocks. That there were alleles back then 
that influenced our distant ancestors to behave in ways that were adaptive, those genes became more common 300,000 years later. As complex as our culture is, you can still see the results. As Wilson put it, the genes hold culture on a leash. The leash is very long, but inevitably values will be constrained in accordance with their effects on the human gene pool. The brain is a product of evolution. Human behavior, like the deepest capacities for emotional response which drive and guide it, is the circuitous technique by which human genetic material has been and will be kept intact. A difficulty with this is that human behavior is ridiculously complicated. I know of no other species in the animal kingdom where a woman in a sumo wrestler suit would assault her ex-girlfriend in a gay pub after the ex-girlfriend waved at a man dressed as a Snickers bar. Okay. That's actually not the craziest headline. I considered using for this slide a headline uh, in which a man is quoted as saying, putting pop rocks under my foreskin was the worst decision I've ever made. No other species does crazy stuff like that. No other species has Florida man. Human behavior is unfathomably complicated, and it is also exceptionally phenotypically plastic, and a huge amount of it does depend on learning and on culture you don't have any genes that predispose you to speaking English. Uh, the fact that you do is entirely a product of your learning. If you're a native speaker, it's entirely a product of the fact that you were raised by people speaking English. And if you, you know, are a American of European descent, but if by some interesting circumstance you'd been adopted and were raised by somebody speaking Chinese or Telugu or Swahili, you would grow up speaking those and your genes would have absolutely nothing to do with it. So there's enormous amounts of human behavior that does depend on what you learn. And the reason why the protesters were getting so upset is that the idea that people behave in certain ways because of their biology has been weaponized in exceptionally nasty ways. Uh, that poster just says, Del Yuda, the Jew. It's a Nazi poster. And the hand of a brave Nazi is pulling back the curtain on the Jew, who is Kriegsanstifter, Kriegsverlängerer, uh, the instigator of war and the prolonger of war, because the Jews are in this secret conspiracy uh, to manipulate world history and control world society. Actually, probably not, but uh, that's the way they fought back in Germany in the 1930s. And Del Yuda is being shown here not only as genetically different from pure Germans, because he's got these hooded eyes and this huge nose and, you know, thick lips, you know, as opposed to, you know, the kind of blonde, muscular Aryan ideal that the Nazis were putting out. But he's also innately evil. He's not only physically different, he's behaviorally different. And he's never going to behave in ways that do anybody any good, because all he does is stir up trouble and make war. To make sure it's absolutely clear, I do not believe this, and I don't think there's any biological basis for it, and if any of you do believe this, keep your mouth effing shut. But you can see how this idea that genes have an influence on human behavior and human culture got weaponized and has produced you know, some of the worst moral outrages in human history. You know, Killing six million Jews on the basis of this, I mean... You know, that's one of the worst crimes humanity's ever committed. Now, hopefully, you see why the protesters in 1978 were really pissed off about Wilson, because it looked like he might be trying to make ideas like this shit scientifically respectable again. Um, there had been very similar ideas deployed 
in the service of African slavery in the Southern uh, United States. Uh, the vice president of the Confederacy in 1861 made a speech claiming that the Confederacy was founded on the scientific fact that Africans were naturally fitted to be slaves and not govern themselves, and this was simply part of their biological nature. There is an absolutely blood-curdling tradition of scientists finding support for innate white supremacy. Uh, a book by Stephen Jay Gould called The Mismeasure of Man lays a lot of that out. And such ideas are not entirely gone even in our day and age. Uh, you can still find them on some of the nastier corners of Facebook. Here's another example. We talked about Bateman's rule earlier, the rule that the sex with less to invest in reproduction will maximize its fitness by reproducing as much as possible. We saw some examples why that I trust made the point clear that Bateman's rule is a, at best it's a rule of thumb and it's got so many exceptions to it that it doesn't work very well even just as a rule of thumb. There's any number of cases where organisms seemingly violate Bateman's rule. But if you apply this literally to humans, like my anthropology professor did in the spring of 1989, um, if you apply this to humans, his argument was that what men look for is youth and beauty, which are correlated with fertility, and also that men seek out variety. Women don't because for a woman to be promiscuous does not increase the number of kids that she's going to have. As the old joke goes, it takes a woman nine months to have a baby, no matter how many men you put on the job. The number of offspring that a woman can have is constrained by the fact that she's got nine months of pregnancy. Uh, and in traditional cultures, uh, breastfeeding probably for more than two years and breastfeeding tends to depress ovulation. So she's only got a limited number of attempts. So her best move is to be very choosy and go for men who are good providers and protectors. A man to conceive a child only needs um, a, about a teaspoon of fluid and two minutes of his time. One would hope it's more than two minutes, but let's get real here. And so a man can maximize the number of offspring he has by reproducing as often as possible. That would seem to legitimize things like this. Uh, I don't know if you remember this. This was a reality TV series about 15, 20 years ago uh, with Hugh Hefner, uh, the publisher of Playboy, uh, and his three uh, very young, um, very look like they would be fertile um, blonde girlfriends all living together in the Playboy mansion. Um, my roommate at the time used to watch this all the time, so I've seen some episodes of it, and it's pretty damn cheesy. And you could see this as giving an aura of scientific approval to what would consider very unsavory behavior. You know, you know, imagine a man saying, well, honey, yes, it's true. Uh, I picked up those other girls at the bar, and I slept with them and also with a couple of uh, girls from work and also your sister, but I can't help it because it's in my nature. Evolution has programmed me to seek sexual variety. Um, so I'm just doing what comes naturally and evolution has not programmed you to seek variety. It has programmed you to seek out stable partnerships with good providers uh, so why don't you go make me a sandwich? Okay, the female students of you, if that actually, if you actually heard that, I'm assuming you would probably not let that guy finish his sentence because you would have beaten him to death by this stage. But you can see how this can be viewed of giving an aura of respectability to some very sexist behavior patterns. I'll mention, by the way, that one problem is that it commits the naturalistic fallacy, meaning just because something is natural by 
a culture standards of behavior or just because something is natural biologically does not mean it is morally good. It is natural for me to be blind as a damn bat. That doesn't mean it's morally wrong for me to wear glasses. It may be natural for human men to seek out a variety of copulatory partners. That does not mean it is moral for them to do so. And it may not even be all that natural simply because humans are born so helpless that it really does take a great deal of investment from both parents if you're going to raise kids successfully. Having been a dad for 10 years, I know this. Um, I know this very well. Um, the asymmetry of investment is not nearly that great. I was joking when I said that it takes a uh, man uh, two minutes of his time and a teaspoon of fluid uh, in order to have a baby. Uh, if that baby is going to survive and succeed, it takes a lot more investment than that. We're not nearly as asymmetrical as you know, this cheap ass version of Bateman's rule would have it. The other problem is it's very easy to use evolutionary psychology to tell just so stories. I don't know if you know the original just so stories. There were stories by the British author Rudyard Kipling uh, about um, how animals got their traits. There was one about how elephants used to have short noses, but a young elephant was very curious about everything and went to ask the crocodile what he had for dinner. And the crocodile grabbed him by the nose and pulled it and stretched it out into a trunk. And that's how the elephant got his trunk. So just so stories in evolutionary biology are very, very easy to come up with, but they're stories that are either wrong, untestable, or incoherent. So a paper that came out in 2007, residents of the UK were shown paired blocks of color and asked to select which one they liked best. Uh, over there on the um, x-axis, you can see the blocks of color that were used on the y-axis, that's the mean proportion that are preferred. The curve in yellow is men in the UK. And you can say their highest preference, uh, the peak of that curve is shifted over to, um, uh, over to the, uh, uh, the right. Uh, men tended to prefer bluish and greenish shades. Females tended to prefer reddish and pinkish shades. Uh, you can see their peak is over there, over on the left. They proposed that the reason why UK women tended to like pinks and reds more than UK men who tended to like greens and blues was that this goes back to our distant hunter-gatherer ancestors over 100,000 years ago. In many societies today that live like that, men do the hunting and women specialize in gathering plant foods, digging up roots or picking ripe berries or things like that. And that red sensitivity was adaptive for females because what females needed to do in order to enable their offspring to survive was to pick ripe fruits and berries, which are the most nutritious and which tend to be red and pink. So female brain should be specialized for gathering related tasks. tasks. Uh, trichromacy, the ability, uh, three different color receptors, are modern adaptations in primate evolution thought to have evolved to facilitate the identification of ripe yellow fruit or edible red leaves embedded in green foliage. As a gatherer, the female would be, need to be more aware of color information than the hunter. Another reason they proposed was the need to discriminate subtle changes in skin tone uh, for social sexual signaling. Uh, humans, of course, signal a lot of their moods by blushing, either turning red with anger or, you know, in the case of Sailor Moon here, 
uh, red with, I guess she's falling in love because there's hearts over there. Um, I, I suppose, I'm, I'm not familiar with this. And females hold this adaptation for their roles as caregivers and empathizers because women evolved to be nurturing. Men, of course, are very stoic, never show emotions. Go out and kill mammoth. Um, if not kill mammoth, you know, hide emotions about it. Go out, do better tomorrow. Uh. Uh, but it's the females that have evolved to say, oh, what's the matter, honey? And sense emotional moods. And also take care of children uh, because people get... Uh, you know, when people have fevers, uh, their skin turns red. And so women taking care of their children, would ha it would be adaptive for them to be drawn to subtle shades of red and pink because that's the way they can help their, uh, their children. You have to think, of course, that, of course, the people, anybody, this is all in the paper. I'm not making this shit up. And you can tell the paper was written by white guys uh, because quite a large portion of the human population is dark-skinned and you cannot easily see um, pinkish red skin tones. It is very hard to tell when, you know, someone of African descent is blushing. So either, you know, dark-skinned people are at a terrible evolutionary disadvantage because mommy could not tell when her babies had a fever or this explanation for why women like pink is BS. You can tell there's some sexism embedded in it, right? How men are, you know, not signaling their emotions, but women have to be more in tune with emotional states because women are, you know, emotionally receptive while men are supposed to be stoic and not show emotion unless they're in a honky-tonk crying in their beer to the tune of He Stopped Loving Her Today by George Jones. Or was it George Strait? Doesn't matter. Here's the other thing. The researchers did the same thing with Chinese test subjects, um, UK residents who'd been born in China. And in this case, they did not see a great distinction. Both men and women preferred red shades, and there was very little difference between them. Uh, you can see the curves right there. Both men and women's preference are shifted over to the red. The reason for this is not because Chinese women have never been selected for their ability to distinguish ripe fruit. It's almost certainly cultural. If you go into a Chinese restaurant, especially around Chinese New Year, you'll see an awful lot of red decorations uh, because red is associated with good luck and good fortune. You know, if you had grown up in a Chinese family, you know, one custom that I think you'd like very much is getting gifts of money from your older relatives at about the time of Chinese New Year in red paper envelopes. Again, as a sign of good luck and good fortune. So if you had grown up able to buy whatever video game you absolutely had to have because grandma and grandpa had given you money in red paper envelopes, you'd probably grow up really liking red. And that has everything to do with culture and nothing to do with selection. You know, it's, you know, there is, as far as I know, there's no evidence that Chinese men ever evolved to like red berries because they went out and gathered red fruit. This has everything to do with behavior patterns that people have learned and passed on culturally through teaching brain to brain, not through their genes. And it turns out that if you look, you know, in the West, we have this prejudice of associating blue with boys and pink with girls, right? And we even have these stupid gender reveal parties, you know, where you set off fireworks and if the smoke is blue, it's a boy. If it's pink, it's a girl. And if it burns down half of goddamn California, well, oh well, tough luck. 
uh, you know, toy makers these days will make two different versions of the same damn toy, blue for boys and pink for girls. I've actually seen sets of uh, those giant Lego blocks uh, that one-year-olds will play with uh, made in blue and pink sets. Target has them. That preference only dates back to about 1940. Before that, blue was seen as feminine uh, in part because in religious art, traditionally the Virgin Mary wears blue. Um, the only female character in Western religious art uh, that wears pink is Mary Magdalene, who was assumed to have been a prostitute. You might have heard of phrases like scarlet woman. Uh, good girls wore blue. Pink was actually seen as masculine 100 years ago uh, because it was suitable for boys because it's a toned down version of the very forceful and fiery red color. Blue, on the other hand, was seen as relaxing, you know, not very forceful and therefore suited for girls. So my point is that these preference for, you know, blue for boys and pink for girls depends entirely on your culture. And it's in the case of the West, it's not even a very old preference. You know, before about 1940, uh, the preferences, if anything, were actually reversed. So we have no evidence that these preferences have a genetic basis at all. Um, they're not the kind of thing that is carried by genes. They have everything to do with culture. And coming up with a genetic explanation is an example of a just so story. It sounds like a very plausible explanation for why boys like blue and girls like pink. When the fact is that there's no evidence that boys always do like blue or girls always do like pink. Those preferences have everything to do with culture. They've got nothing to do with your genes at all. And it's very easy to come up with some kind of interesting human behavior, invent a plausible sounding explanation for why that behavior would have been adaptive on the Serengeti plane 100,000 years ago, and then either never test it or test it and find that the, find that the whole story falls apart completely. There are a few cases where Evo Psych does seem to work very, very well. And I'll give you one in the uh, remaining four minutes before we have to leave. Human babies have an extremely long childhood. Um, you know, chimps, baby chimpanzees can walk around within hours of birth. Uh, humans, it takes an immensely longer time. And human parents have to invest an enormous amount of energy if they're going to reproduce successfully. Uh, there's nine months of pregnancy. Uh, there's breastfeeding. Uh, then there's all that teaching that you have to do and all of the video games that you have to buy them. And then they start borrowing the car and getting surly. Stepchildren and stepparents don't share genes and so it's adaptive for parents to take care of their offspring. A parent that loves uh, its babies is going to have leave more copies of its genes than a parent that drop kicks its babies. So you would think that there would be very strong selection for genes that influence parents to nurture their offspring. Okay, it seemingly makes sense Stepchildren don't share those genes with their step-parents. Stepchildren don't con contribute directly to the fitness of step-parents. And this sets up what's called the Cinderella effect. An awful lot of cultures around the world have stories about stepmothers that abuse their stepchildren. Uh, Cinderella is one example. Uh, Snow White is another one. The, uh, the evil queen is Snow White's stepmom. Uh, I'm told there's lots of Indian stories about stepmothers working their stepdaughters to death. Um, there, this shows up in some Viking sagas that I've read. 
And it shows up in the fact that the single greatest risk factor for child abuse is the presence of a step parent in the household. Um, if there are two natural parents, the incidence of abuse for children between zero and two is one in 10,000. It's six in 10,000 if there is one natural parent and one step parent. The difference is extremely striking. The incidence of child murder is 600 times higher in step parent households than in households where there's both biological parents. Uh, if two biological parents are raising a child, there may be times when they feel like killing the kid. Trust me on this, but they don't actually do it. Child murder is still mercifully extremely rare, but it is still immensely more common in houses, households where there's a step parent. This does not mean that every step parent is abusive. Most step parents aren't. Um, but when you have a case where there's an abusive parent that has biological children and stepchildren, the parent usually spares the biological children and punishes the stepchildren. There's less subtle signs of this, um, less subtle than, a, or more subtle than abuse. Uh, there was a study done in New Mexico about 20 years ago that showed that step parents invested less money in college education for stepchildren than they did for biological children. Uh, step parents on average tended to play with their stepchildren less. Uh, step parents tended to be later in seeking medical care uh, for stepchildren than they were for biological children. This is not because step parents are automatically monsters. They may not really want to be, beat their stepchildren, and it may not be advantageous for them to do so. Um, if you have a biological parent and a step parent that are raising kids together, the biological parent will often try to defend its kids or refuse to reproduce with the step parent that's proven to be abusive. So beating your stepchildren Beating your kid like a redheaded stepchild, as they say in Arkansas, is not necessarily really advantageous from an evolutionary point of view. We're not talking about lions where a male lion killing the offspring of the females of his pride will make the females come into heat sooner. You know, this is not what's going on here. But the idea is that child raising requires an enormous investment. Child raising is frequently extremely frustrating. And it's been suggested that step parents have lower abilities to tolerate the incredible frustrations that come with raising kids. It's not that step parents are deliberately out to kill their stepkids, but their tolerance may be lower their willingness to invest energy may be lower and it may take more conscious effort on their part to overcome uh, these barriers to successful parenting. Many step parents do overcome these, but the pattern here seems to be cross-cultural and it seems to have an explanation that is testable with data and makes sense from the point of view of evolutionary psych. So I am not saying evolutionary psych is always wrong, but it is an idea that you have to handle very carefully. And it's an idea where you need to be especially critical in your thinking and not assume that a given human behavior pattern exists the way that it does because it's been selected for, because it's easy to make very bad arguments to that effect. 